Hello, sunshine. I'm Alexi Lawless, and welcome to the State of the Union podcast, where we look at the beautiful game on and off the field through the lens of red, white, and blue colored glasses. This week, we'll be talking Gold Cup and Messi and Atlanta and the athlete's mind and Altador and Descendants and Ted Lasso and valuations and water skiing and so much more. But first, joining me, as always, my friend, my colleague, my guiding light, David Mossy, a soccer savant and a Fox soccer researcher and writer extraordinaire. Mossy, how are you on this Monday yet again? Monday, July 9th. Uh, 19th, right? Yeah. So Monday, July 19th in the year 2021, as we roll on through this summer of soccer. I'm doing well. Uh, looking forward to a rare day off this summer, which today is as soon as we're done taping, I can actually take care of some life stuff that I've been putting off. Uh, so that'll well, be Well, you nice. deserve to have a little bit of a life, my friend, for all that you do and give us. And uh, yeah, I mean, look, I know you're like me. You, you love to work. We love what we do. And we're very, very fortunate to do what we uh, do. Uh, we had a full week last week, every single day, uh, something uh, something that was going on. Um, I, I love it. Bring it on. I mean, I, I am in my element when it comes to these tournaments. And as we've said, we went from Copa America right into Gold Cup. And now we're getting the tail end of the group stage of uh, of Gold Cup. And we do. We have a, a strange day off in, uh, in Gold Cup. And we'll get to that uh, in a second. Are you watching anything, my friend? Uh, this morning, I watched uh, one more episode of Top Boy. I am uh, crawling to the finish line uh, on that show. Uh, the uh, true crime doc uh, about the murder that took place in Brazil, that is next uh, on the list. I will definitely figure out a way to watch that sometime in the next few nights. So... Uh, that's all I got. Now, do you, when something is in Portuguese, do you watch it in Portuguese or do you put, uh, in, do you have subtitles or do you, if it's Portuguese, you just watch in Portuguese, right? Yeah. Now, how is this one? It's uh, it's obviously they speak in Portuguese with English subtitles. Yeah. So you can do two things uh, in some of these things. And I don't know if, if people have experienced this, but nowadays they're starting to dub in the English language in addition to the actual subtitles. I don't like it because I think you you lose even more. So I actually I have the Portuguese going and then I have the English subtitles. And that's what I did. But there are some some that they already have. And they I guess they go and get actors to you know, do as, as, as close as they possibly can from a, a translation and, and act out what the real people are saying, even though it's a documentary. So, all right. Um, let's see, what am I doing? Uh, I, uh, a couple of things. Uh, I watched a, uh, a film called Filmage, the story of descendants uh, about this pioneering punk pop band, actually right out of here, right in my backyard here in Southern California and how important they were uh, from a, influential uh, perspective and how how many bands they influenced especially with that whole pump punk uh pop uh situation that happened through uh through the 90s and how it wasn't just raw type of music there was there was melody behind it and that was a really really interesting uh, thing because I, i'll be honest i didn't listen to the descendants uh growing up and i i didn't realize how influential they were to so many and especially when it comes to that that genre of uh of music and then uh while it's not something that i've watched uh i was uh you know incredibly fortunate to be invited to the ted lasso premiere here in uh, in los angeles now it happened in the same night that the united states played and so we had to finish our work um, with the U.S. game, and then we hightailed it over to the after party, which was in Hollywood, and it was fun. It was great, wonderful, um, and, and thank you so much to the folks there from Ted Lasso that invited us. Uh, for those that don't know, um, it is heading, it's starting its second season. It's already already actually been picked up for its third season, and uh, for those that have listened any length of time, you know that you know we started watching it, uh, and I started right right when it came out, and I was so happy to be able to be there and tell you know the main architects of this which is uh, Jason Sudeikis and Brendan Hunt how much I enjoyed the show and not just congratulate them because you know they're they're all they're both nominated and the show is nominated for a ridiculous amount of awards and Emmys and all that kind of stuff but also to to explain to them from a from a soccer perspective and look I don't speak for everybody but I am in the soccer community and I wanted to make sure they understood that for those of us that have been around a long time and, you know, we talk about being at times sensitive and uh, insecure a little bit. And it comes from at times being made fun of. Uh, I just I love the heart of the show. And as I said, when I was reviewing it for the first time, it, it was laughing 
with us as opposed to at us. And, uh, and I think they appreciate it. It was really fun to talk about how they have gotten into it and you know, their soccer background or lack of soccer background uh, when it comes to this. But it's, it is a work of art, what they, what they are doing. And it's incredibly fun, funny, but it's also has incredible heart and it could be incredibly moving. And that it's, it's not really about soccer, let's be honest. Um, but they had a lot of soccer people um, and a lot of soccer people were at the, at the premiere and at the after party. So I think they recognize how the soccer community has embraced it and therefore provided an authenticity that they are looking for um, when it so very easily could have been just the, the vignettes that NBC made where it was much more laughing at as opposed to with. And so it was really interesting to talk to those guys about how they, they developed the stories and, and they developed the character. And you know, I like to think that they appreciate it, <laughs> but, uh, but who knows? Free drinks and wonderful food. It was a, a really good time. Uh, Mossy, should we light this candle? Let's do it. All right. Uh, we're going to jump right into the Gold Cup. Like I said, we are you know, getting to the end of the group stage. And from a U.S. men's national team perspective, we'll, we'll, start, off, we'll start off there, if you will. Um, so far, so good in terms of the results. And we know that this Gold Cup, this team that Greg Berhalter has brought, to, in many people's eyes, is a B team. I find that offensive and disrespectful, but I completely understand why relative to the team that features the likes of Christian Pulisic and Weston McKinney and Tyler Adams, people are looking at this as a downgrade. Having said that, uh, three games into the tournament, three wins. They won their group, which is, let's be honest, expected of the U.S. It's what we do and have always done when it comes to the Gold Cup. I don't think that anybody after this group stage is ooing and eyeing about this U.S. team. Um, but I'm not sure that they expected to either. Uh, first game against Haiti was a lackluster affair and certainly uninspiring with uh, getting away with 1-0, although Haiti was a much better opponent than, opponent than I think people thought they were going to be. Second game against Martinique, 6-1, to one, an expected drubbing of a vastly inferior opponent. And third game, uh, we're recording this on Monday, which happened yesterday, uh, Sunday, a one nothing win against Canada in which they scored in the first 20 seconds and then proceeded to hang on for dear life for the next 89 uh, minutes and 40 seconds uh, of the game. The, there, are, there are good things to, to, uh, to point to, and there are bad things to point to. I guess, where do you want to start, Mossy, when, uh, when it comes to these games and, and the team? Well, first off, let me say it's been a very good tournament so far. I've been impressed with the level of the non-Mexico and U.S. teams. There's a tendency when those two teams struggle in a CONCACAF game to chalk it up to their failings, but you have to give some credit to the opposition. Uh, I've really liked what I've seen in this tournament from Canada, El Salvador, Honduras, Jamaica. It's really got me excited for the octagonal. And also, I love what I've seen from Qatar, which has me thinking already about the World Cup. So, um, yeah, we can get into where the U.S. has gone wrong, but let's give some credit. That Canada had a lot to do with uh, that match being difficult yesterday and also Haiti in the opening game. Absolutely. And, and to your point, I think what we are seeing, I mean, we're, we're upwards of, of close to 60 players that are going to uh, from, from from Major League Soccer that are involved in this tournament. And they're just going to keep going because, by the way, uh, CONCACAF has allowed teams to make changes now when the group stage is over. I just saw. I think an announcement where uh, Rodolfo Pizarro for uh, Mexico is going to be added to the, the Mexican national team, another uh, MLS player. And I think we are the, we are the architects of a, well, maybe sometimes when we're, if we were to lose uh, of our demise, but we're also the architects of all of these nations in CONCACAF, 41 members, rising and, and being better. And that's a, that's a good thing. I think that that is certainly a feather in the cap of the U.S. But it also means that we are going to face better competition. And so some of the teams that in the past just haven't had the wherewithal and the resources and the talent uh, and the experience to be competitive in this environment are, are going to start to, to do better. I mean, we saw El Salvador take Mexico to the brink uh, yesterday. And it was wonderful to see being coached by my old friend and, and, uh, and teammate Hugo Perez. And, you know, he, I I'm sure he's very proud of the way that his team played as he should be as El Salvador should be. And to your point, the octagonal it's coming. And I think some of the traditional notions that we have maybe flipped on, uh, flipped on their head. Um, you know, as I mentioned, the, the first game against Haiti, there was this collective, uh, 
sigh and um you know a a, a I guess it would be a disappointment when the lineup came out and the likes of Jossie Zardes is starting or Jackson Ewell, because I think that there was a desire from much of the American soccer fan base when it comes to this U.S. team, this particular U.S. team in this tournament, to see as many new faith, new faces or inexperienced faces as possible. Now, that then translated into the second game. Uh, where it was six to one against Martinique, where we started to see a lot of these uh, these new faces. Your Daryl DK starting, uh, your John Luca Busio starting. Uh, you know the, these types of players that everybody's really kind of interested in. Eric Williamson, and I think that that both in terms of the performance and in terms of the players that were used, there was a much more positive reaction after that game. You know, I, I came on air and I was, you know, I'm I'm not I, I'm not grouchy. I'm not grumpy and I'm not, uh, I, I think what happens is when you're negative, it resonates much more in that people remember it. Nobody remembers all the positive things that you say. And so when I came on air, I wanted to give perspective and make, make sure that the way I was feeling about it was that, okay, it's Martinique. And yes, you play the team that's in front of you, but it can give you a false sense of security. And talking about Greg Berhalter, I think what he ultimately did was, I think he devalued the Martinique game in terms of the players that played in it. And I think he maybe raised the value of the Haiti game. And that, that I think that that's actually the right thing to do. And so he melded the two and took what he felt was the best from both of those games and put them together for that third game against Canada. But in doing so, he also changed the formation and showed up with a 3-5-2, which enabled him to get both Daryl DK and Jassy Zardes on the field at the same time in a forward striker type of capacity. It, it didn't work. Okay, let's be honest. The U.S., as I said, scored in the first 20 seconds uh, with Shaq Moore. Everybody's going crazy, rightfully so. Everybody thinks this is going to be great. And then they proceeded, as I said, to to either forget how to play or just completely capitulate and absorb pressure. They didn't create another chance, uh, a clear cut chance uh, through the game. And I don't think that the, the formation worked in terms of having two players up top, three in the back uh, and the five in the midfield. I also don't think that the, per the personnel, uh, the DK and the Zardes tandem necessarily is some in a, in a three, five, two is something that, uh, that worked. Someone like Gianluca Busio, who came out smelling like a rose against Martinique, then in this game against Canada, was nowhere to be found. And he's young and he's an experience, and these, are, these things are going to happen. So ultimately, after the Canada game, you know, I came on air and I said, this was, a, this was a very poor performance, but a very good result in that they won the group, they avoid Mexico, and they did what we expect of them in terms of the results. But how those results came, if you care, how those results came about, I think is going to give you pause and going to give you concern that this group right now can find a way to the final and or win the, uh, the Gold Cup. How's, uh, how's that for a synopsis, Mossy? I agree with everything you said. It's a oddly constructed roster because there are no real out-and-out -out wingers. So he's either asking guys who are more center forwards like Joachini and Hoppy and Zardes to play off DK or putting somebody that's more of a playmaker like Christian Wildan or Sebastian Legette in those roles. Uh, so that's limiting his options a little bit. But yeah, I would say that the big winners of this group stage have been James Sands, who uh, in that hybrid center back holding midfielder role, I think is really impressed. Um, Shaq Moore, who wasn't even supposed to start. Reggie Cannon gets hurt. He steps in. Mm -hmm. He's played very well. Sam Vines, I think, has also done a nice job. He got the winner against Haiti, and Shaq Moore <laughs> gets the winner after just 20 seconds against Canada, fastest goal in U.S. history. Um, Matt Turner, whenever he's been called upon, I think, has done well. So there have been some positives. Uh, but yeah, Buzio and DK, it's been a bit of a roller coaster because coming off that Martinique game, everybody was lauding them. They're the second comings. And, and then it was really sort of a, a come back down to earth situation against Canada. Buzio, we're sort of learning that playing him in one of those deeper central midfield positions against a weaker team where you're dominating possession, he gets to just spray passes around, that works. But against a team that's going to come at you and then, you know, he really doesn't provide that sort of uh, physical presence that you need in the center of the park. And, and 
DK, DK likewise, he can sort of bully uh, weaker teams. But, uh, you know, in, in certain games where you, you, he did get exposed a little bit, his hold-up play still needs some work, that first touch. So, which is fine. I mean, they're both very young players. They're undoubtedly talented, great potential. And it's good that we're seeing some of the flaws that they can work on now moving forward. And look, you can, as, as a good team, good teams at times can play poorly and win. And that is something that good teams have in their, in their arsenal. But you can't make a habit of it. This type of performance, if, they, if the U.S. shows up like this in a quarterfinal type of uh, game, I think it's going to be problematic. What I think Greg Berhalter is going to do now is because the U.S. is so good, even this U.S. team is so good, it, it gave him the, the freedom and the ability to experiment. Okay, you experimented in the group stage. You didn't get dinged for it. You got all the wins that you, that, uh, that you needed and you won the group. Now is the time to stop experimenting, okay? Whatever information you gleaned from that group phase, you use it to put the best collection of 11 players on the field in this quarterfinal match that's going to give your team the best chance uh, of winning. And I don't know ultimately what that is going to uh, going to look like. And you know when I when I uh, when I think about this this team right now, all right, you mentioned a couple of players. Uh, I agree with with a lot of the people that you uh, that you pointed to. I actually think before Walker Zimmer went went down, and we don't know what's going to happen. I think he continued to impress. Um, I thought that uh, uh, who was in the back, Robinson, right? Um, I thought he was really really good, especially one on one. And uh, at times he was strung out and I think was really, was really good. Right. Uh, it was Robinson next to uh, Zimmerman right there with Sands, right. In the, in the back three. Yep. And you know, the back three was interesting because while, while Greg Berhalter has played a back three, back five, whatever you want to call it um, at times, predominantly this team plays a back four. And that, that for me is again, the experimentation that's happening. So going forward here, Whatever this team is best in, if you believe it's best in the back three, okay, but put them in the best, give them the best chance of succeeding individually and collectively as a team when it comes to uh, uh, who they're going to play. I was really impressed with Canada, uh, and I, sh- I, I shouldn't be because they continue to, to you know, prove that this is, this is a, I guess it's a golden generation. I mean, keep in mind, Canada has not qualified for a World Cup since 1986, but the way that they control the ball, the ability to win the ball back, and I guess the inability of this U.S. team to find any sense of rhythm against Canada. The only thing that was missing was, was the goal. And it w- I don't think it would have surprised anybody had Canada found a way to score against the U.S. Uh, so that's the bad news for the U.S. Good news is they, they, they bent for the entire game, but they didn't, they didn't break, and they got that result. But I think that they have to they have to really look at this game closely uh, going forward. We don't know who they are going to face ultimately uh, in, in this next qualifying uh, uh, in the quarterfinals here, which are what, July 25th? Is that right, Masi? Uh, the U.S. will play July 25th. Okay, yeah. the U.S. will play July 25th. We don't know what's going to happen. Um, you mentioned uh, you mentioned Busio, uh, and you know the, he, he, regardless of what happens here in this Gold Cup, it sounds like that he has a, you know, a very exciting future ahead of him because – Rumors flying around that the deal is already done when it comes to him going to Serie A, uh, going to newly promoted uh, Venezia um, out there in Venice to play in, uh, in Serie A. And the numbers that are being thrown out in terms of the transfer fee are upwards of, uh, you know, in, in the $10 million to $12 million range. And this is now going to be paired also with the Tanner Tessman signing also to Venezia. So automatically from a broadcast perspective, you're going to want to watch Venezia when they play this year. And for them, it's going to be about staying up. This is a team that has come up from Serie uh, C and their whole goal this year is to, is to stay up. Uh, the interesting thing, I mean, we were talking about this Moai on the set the other day, the amount of money between these two players that has been spent to buy t- Tanner Tessman and, uh, and, and Buzio, if, if it tr- proves to be true, I'm I'm saying with the way that Tejan Buchanan is playing, you might want to spend that money on Tejan Buchanan from Canada because this guy, uh, he just keeps getting better and better and better. And uh, you know, for those that watch him at New England, you know what he's all about. We watched him with the uh, with the Olympic, uh, the, with the Canadian Olympic team, and now he's continuing to to shine with this Canadian team. And once again, 
in the same way that I talked about El Salvador in the octagonal, now with Canada in the octagonal, you know, some, some of those traditional views of teams might change very, very quickly if this Canadian team, and by the way, they're missing uh, players. I know the U.S. is missing players, but Canada is missing players too in uh, Jonathan David and, uh, and uh, Alfonso Davies. So good stuff when it, comes, uh, when it comes to Canada. So congratulations, I guess, in a losing effort to the U.S., but congratulations nonetheless, because I do think that our, um, you know, our optimism about this Canada team is warranted. Uh, let the record show. You like to make fun of me for being pompous in the way I pronounce certain words. You just said Siri Chi. Uh, Did I? <laughs> well, uh, I'm. I, I feel like I'm pretty much Italian. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I actually was about to go. Uh, I was about to say what you just said, which is uh, I kept thinking about the octagonal and looking at the Canada lineups in these three games and the way they played. And then imagining plugging in Alfonso Davies and Jonathan David in there. So, yeah, they are going to be a force. And keep in mind, that's the U.S.'s first home game in the octagonal September 5th uh, in Nashville on FS1. Although the El Salvador game three days earlier, which is slated to be an away game, could end up being in the United States uh, as well. So stay tuned. Uh, I mean, not that that necessarily is going to mean that, <laughs> that it's going to <laughs> you know hurt their chances of having a, a home field advantage. I mean what we have seen over the years uh, from an El Salvador community in DC and what we saw last night in, uh, in Dallas where El Salvador took on Mexico. And there were, I mean, it was an El Salvador crowd. There was blue everywhere. So, and if they end up not playing down in uh, San Salvador um, and they play in the U S there's plenty of places where I think they can get a really, really good crowd and, and make it difficult, especially because, this is a much better El Salvador team than what we've seen uh, than we have seen in the past. Let's, uh, you mentioned uh, you mentioned Qatar a little bit, so let's take a little jump around some other teams here. Uh, let's start with, with with Qatar, the invited guests here, and uh, you know as I've said, if you are an invited guest to a tournament, you are being invited for a reason, and one of the reasons is to make the tournament better. And I think without a doubt, Qatar has come in and has made this tournament better. They're an exciting team. They score goals. I feel much more confident that this is a team that is going to be worthwhile when it comes to next November at when they are hosting. And keep in mind, this is a team that plays all, they all play domestically in the Qatar league. Yes, they've had some different loans here, here and there, but this is a team that plays all domestically. And when you look at, you know, players like Akram Afif and Ali and Hados and, you know, these types of, these types of players, it's really, really interesting. And, and, and remember in the, in Copa America, we, we kind of had the, uh, the, the people's team of uh, Vino Tinto for Venezuela. Qatar is much better than, than Venezuela. Don't, don't get me wrong, but I think a lot of people are, are pleasantly surprised by this Qatar team. Anything to say about Qatar, my friend? Uh, Akram Afif, my new favorite player, walks into the Brazil midfield. Especially if it includes Fred, which I, I, just, I asked you the other day if you would rather have Fred or Akram <laughs> Avif. I mean, and he's I been good. Just, he's been really good. And he I actually just got a tweet goals. from somebody saying, boy, you're really hard on Fred. Uh, th does he owe you money or something? <laughs> 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 but no, I, I, I've been really impressed by Qatar. It's, you know, and look, putting aside all the controversy surrounding that nation hosting a World Cup, it, it's really got me excited for them as, as a host team for that tournament because they are such a fun team to watch. Uh, I, I kind of knew it already. I mean, the way they played in the Asian Cup sure. in 2019 when they won that. And also they were invited guests at the 2019 Copa America. And although they went out on the group stage, they gave a good account of themselves in all three games. Everybody came away from that tournament impressed, but they're really showing it again here. Yeah, you mentioned it. Al Hados, Akram Afif, Amoaz Ali, the striker up there who had an incredible miss must be said uh against uh uh Grenada but then came back and scored in the same game uh so yeah uh very very high on this team and they've definitely added a lot to this tournament I'm hoping they advance to the knockout stage they could potentially face Mexico in the quarterfinals depending on how things go and that would be a very very fun game well, you know, when we when I'm looking at the, the I guess the hierarchy of this tournament right now I still have Mexico uh, they haven't looked great but they are a slow burn and they're still Mexico uh, I still have them as the favorites. I still have the U.S. next. Then it gets really interesting because then you're in your, and I would put Qatar, Qatar, Canada, Honduras area. Um, I, the U.S. is either going to play uh, against Costa Rica or Jamaica. I, I think that this U.S. team is much better suited to playing against Costa Rica because um, I think we match up better with them. And I don't think that this Costa Rica team is very, very good. And I think the Jamaica team would give us more problems. But it remains to be seen uh, who the U.S. is going is going to match up. What are your thoughts on uh, on El Tree? We saw them 
eke out a one nothing win against uh, El Salvador last uh, last night. And, you know, not Tata Martino. I mean, he's, he's getting the results and they win the group again, but not in emphatic fashion. Yeah, not overly impressed at all. Uh, the Chucky Lozano injury, and, and we must say, it's been a real bummer that we lost Alfonso Davies on the eve of the tournament and then Chucky Lozano 10 minutes into the first game, probably the two biggest stars and best players uh, from the original squads that were announced. Um, I, so I think his absence and also the one of Andres Guardado has sort of narrowed the gap between Mexico and everybody else. It, it went from being an A-minus team to a little, little bit more of a B-plus-ish team. Keep in mind, there are also players that could have been at the Gold Cup that are instead at the Olympics, like Diego Lainez, who scored against the U.S. in that Nations League final. Charlie Rodriguez, Cesar Montes, Ochoa is there as an overage player. So, um, you know, I, I agree with you. They're, they're the best team. Gun to my head, I would pick them to win this Gold Cup. But I don't think, you know, we already made this mistake in another tournament this summer of identifying a team – uh, early on as being the clear cut best team. And, and you were a bit overly bullish on that with Brazil and the Copa America, uh, despite all the evidence that they were very beatable. And, and we saw what happened at the end. And I get a little bit of that sense with Mexico. Uh, they are the favorites, but uh, to me, this team looks highly beatable. Um, and, and we'll see how the knockout stage goes. I, I do like what I've seen from Rogelio Funes Mori. So uh, they have found something there. Now, Raul Jimenez has returned to training with Wolves. So that that's great news. So we'll see if he can get back to his old form. And then he's if, you know, if he, Raul Jimenez returns to his previous form, then he's the starter there. Uh, no, no doubt about it. But Rogelio Funes Mori, I think, has shown that he can be a very useful player for Mexico. Moving really? Forward. You like That's Funes Mori, huh? Uh, but I, I thought that performance against Guatemala was really nice. Not just the two goals, but he had that back heel and, yeah. and in the second half to set up another chance. You, you doesn't do much for you? It, well, I mean, maybe because in, in a strange way, and maybe it's because I have Chicharito on the mind, he reminds me of Chicharito in the way he plays. And maybe that's by design. Maybe, maybe that's kind of what they were looking for, or maybe they feel it's just a better version of, of Chicharito. And look, I know Chicharito has his plenty of his faults, but um, I, I don't see him as anything different and or, or better than what Chicharito would be. And that's that for me would have been the reason to bring in, whether it's Funes Mori or anybody else, that you have a better version of Chicharito. And I'm, I'm, I'm not buying it yet. I, I think he's a good player. I'm not yet certain so, that he is a great player. If Raul Jimenez uh, returns to his previous form sure. and Chicharito keeps doing what he's doing for the Galaxy, you would, if you were the Mexico coach, a major tournament coming up, you would bring Jimenez and Chicharito as your two center forwards. Yeah, I'm, I'm not r completely ruling out Funes Mori. I'm just not sold on him uh, yet. And, and like we said, you know, this is still Mexico. So things are going to continue on and they're going to ramp up uh, as, uh, as we go along. All right, anything else uh, Gold Cup related before we move on, Mossy? Uh, no, that's it. All right. Well, as I said, the quarterfinals uh, will be happening this week. We, we're going to finish up the group stage. There's, there's this, people have asked me why we have Monday off. I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but the group stage actually finishes up. We're recording on Monday, finishes up on, uh, on Tuesday. And then we'll know where and who everybody is, uh, is playing. But once again, the U.S. and Mexico kind of did their job. And certainly from a broadcast perspective, if the soccer gods smile upon us, we can get that U.S.-Mexico final in uh, Las Vegas. But whether it's Qatar or El Salvador or anybody else, there's a lot of uh, soccer to be played and a lot of twists and turns probably before that before that happens. All right, uh, let's uh, let's quickly switch over to uh, MLS because that rolls along as um, as we are uh, in this summer of soccer. Uh, Josie Altador, uh, Moss, you remember him? I don't know if you, you've, you've heard of him or remember him. Absolutely. Back on the score sheet. All right. So uh, Chris Armas, the former coach of Toronto FC, he was fired, uh, didn't even complete the year and actually didn't even coach a game in Toronto because, as we know, the Canadian teams up until this, uh, I guess, this week have been down in either Florida or in uh, in Utah. He uh, he and that organization shut out Josie Altador. Then they fire Armas. Josie Altador is back. And not only does he come back, but he comes back and he scores a goal. Who knows if he's back? All right. Who knows ultimately what the whole brouhaha was about? But when you have a designated player that you are counting on to score goals, it's not good when he can't even train with the team. Something is a, that is a problem um, because you only have so many designated players and you're paying them usually a lot of money. And so this was not a good scene. And obviously with the change in coach, 
uh, or the firing of the coach. We don't know who ultimately is going to take it, uh, to come in on a full time basis. Josie Altador is back in the family, back in the fold and scoring. So congratulations, uh, congratulations to him. Uh, when it comes to the firing of coaches, though, and I, I probably buried the lead here when it comes to Major League Soccer. Gabriel Heinze, right? We hardly knew you, my friend. <laughs> you, you came and went, and it was not good. 16 games, is that what it is, Mossy? I think we're around there. Uh, I mean, if you count CCL, I think it's 17, and then it was 13 MLS, just two wins in 13 MLS games. Okay. Um, where to start on this? So, uh, first off, uh, speaking of designated players that are being left out in the cold, we come to find out over the last week that Joseph Martinez, who didn't play in Copa America, but we knew was getting back to fitness and shape. We come to find out that he is fine from a physical perspective, but it is a coaching choice to not just not have him playing, but he's not even training with the team. Again, there's this, <laughs> this phenomenon of sending high profile players off to, uh, to train on their own for whatever disciplinary reason that may be. Um, so that was one thing that we found out about what, what's going on with, uh, with Gabriel Heinze. Uh, then yesterday, as we were all coming on air, news broke that they have parted ways. They have <laughs> gone, their, gone their separate ways, whatever you want to call it, firing, sacking. Uh, ultimately, he is no longer the coach of Atlanta United. And you know this is how big clubs operate, okay? They, they don't wait around. They don't worry about having to pay people off. It, if it is not working, and it was not working, for whatever reason, either just pure scoreboard type of situation or behind the scenes, which we, we seem to be finding out as it trickles out over the last 24 hours that there's a whole lot more going on. You make the change. And I was really interested to see the reaction to this. And I think what it does highlight is how big Atlanta has become, not just for Atlanta. We know how relevant it is within that market, but also how big it's become for the league in the attention that this garnered and the people that were not just watching the, uh, the car crash, but taking incredible glee, either publicly or privately, in seeing this, uh, this team that was once this, this great thing and this super club flame out and melt down once again and it's it's normal i mean we like to see big bold powerful things fail it's just kind of human nature whether we do it publicly or not it's it's something that human beings do and i think it it, it shows that they are still a big club but they have to do some things and some drastic things right now in order to get back to being that big club from a competitive side and they got a long way to go. And this is a poor reflection on the leadership when it comes to Darren Eels and uh, Carlos Bocanegra. Now two uh, bad hires, if you will. And look, you, you, you do your due diligence and you trust whatever that due diligence is uh, that it's going to hedge your bets and give you the best possible chance of success. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. But, you know, again, this is, these, are, these are individuals that are living off of a very, very successful period of time. And it remains to be seen whether that was just the stars aligning or that was by design because they have not been able to replicate it. And as a matter of fact, the decisions that they have made in many other cases, they would be gone and they would have cleaned house now because of these failures and these very, very public uh, failures and the lack of success or the lack of the ability to continue that success that started out and established this team and made it so relevant uh, going forward. Mossy, do you, what do you think? Why do you think that this went so bad? Well, our uh, new Fox Sports colleague, Doug McIntyre, wrote a bit of an expose on all the behind the scenes issues at uh, Atlanta United. And apparently Heinze was denying the players CBA mandated days off, also limiting the amount of water they could drink during preseason practices. None of which surprises me, by the way, because uh, there were other clubs like Palmeiras in Brazil who were interested in Gabriel Heinze and were scared off by his sort of dictatorial 
uh, personality and he, he, he tends to be a difficult guy to get along with who clashes with players and front office. And so uh, he did have that reputation going in and it played out exactly as uh, some people feared. I mean, he, he has some talents as a coach. He did some interesting things tactically in some of these games, but uh, he's just got to improve that part of it. You got to be able to get along with players and front office better than he does uh, if he's going to have a successful coaching career. So yeah, I, I wasn't all that surprised that this played out the way it did. You got to know that going in. I mean, then, then your due diligence sucked. Okay. <laughs> okay. If you didn't, if you didn't know that that was going to be the case and the minute that that starts happening, okay. Carlos Bocanegra and Darren Eels and the leadership over there, you got to nip that in the bud. You got to make sure that that doesn't happen. And how did, how, how does that kind of stuff, how is that even allowed to happen? Are you just so terrified and scared of your coach that you're not going to say anything that you don't just cut that off at the past? The first time that anything like that even remotely uh, comes to be Nah, come on. I'm not buying that at all. So, um, so, but I think that this is, I think that this is the right thing to do. If this, if this person was, you know, not giving you the results that you need and causing real, real problems behind the scenes, then yeah, you have to make a change. But the same people that thought that it was a good idea to hire him in the first place are now charged with making yet another hire. And I'll be really, really interested to see one, if they continue and two, if they continue, you know, uh, is this the last chance and ultimately who do they decide uh, they want because, you know, while we can giggle and laugh and point and mock from the outside and take, you know, in a certain sense, like I said, a little a, a glee in big teams faltering. The reality is, is that MLS is better with a strong Atlanta. A strong Atlanta makes Major League Soccer better and makes all of the other teams better. It's not a good thing for Atlanta, which has burst on the scene, which sells a boatload of tickets, which is incredibly relevant, which has created an atmosphere that many, many people point to. And it is sold uh, in terms of what that market and that environment game day is. It's not a good thing. It's not a good thing for Atlanta, and they're going to have to right that ship really, really quickly. And I'm not sure that either they have the ability to, and I'm talking about the ability, just the practical ability uh, at their disposal in terms of money and changes and all that kind of stuff, or necessarily the wherewithal, because it certainly hasn't proven it over the last, uh, over the last couple of hires. Um, so we'll see, because they're on our air. Um, I'm sorry. You want to promote that game first? No, no. I'm just saying that we get to see them this week. <laughs> so we're going to find out what this, this new Atlanta looks like this week. Well, so another big name foreign coach flames out. And I know I make this point a lot, but it's worth revisiting. If you look at these supporter shield standings right now, the top five are Brian Schmetzer, Bruce Arena, Peter Vermes, Greg Vanny, and Jim Curtin. And, you know, that's sort of gotten in my head a little bit because Expansion Charlotte recently announced that they hired this Spaniard, Miguel Angel Ramirez, as their first coach, a guy who I love. Uh, I remain bullishly high on him. He just had a bad experience with Internacional in Brazil, but I read nothing into that. Any innovative coach with ideas that take time to implement on the training ground shouldn't be judged by anything that happens in Brazil. It's amazing to me that that type of coach even goes to Brazil um, to manage. But uh, so I'm still super high on this guy. I think he's one of the most promising young managers in world football. So I was going to fire off a tweet and say, great hire by Charlotte. This guy is going to be phenomenal. But then I thought, well, the track record of these types of guys in MLS actually isn't that great. So maybe I'll, I'll, I won't go there yet. Uh, but so, yeah, I mean, again, we're sort of having these conversations. I mean, I know Tata Martino is the one exception, but generally speaking, you know, Matias Almeida, I mean, his translator is getting sent off in games now. I don't know what the heck's going on there. So uh, there is something to the fact that these, these big name foreign managers tend to struggle a little bit in this league. Look, I, we, we talk about this all the time on the pod, the, the desire to appear global and international and cosmopolitan in the things that you do, how you name your team, the way your stadium looks, your aesthetic from a, 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 a brand, uh, all those different things. And what you are, you know, the players that you are recruiting, the coaching staff that you are recruiting, the methods in which you're recruiting, your training, all of that kind of stuff. There is a real desire that to, to be international and cosmopolitan, like I said, because we still equate that with being authentic and genuine. And there's absolutely some things where that is right. But 
you know, but to your point, this is such a strange and unique animal, uh, not just major league soccer, but American soccer. And I do believe that having not just a knowledge and experience, but a, a, a natural um, and historic respect for what is happening and for all of these, you know, these, these very strange and unique aspects of the game. I think that that is valuable. And I think oftentimes it is ig- neglected, ignored, or, or just completely devalued. And, and I think, you know, at your own peril. And, and once again, it doesn't mean that you can't have incredible minds and, and personalities that come in from the outside and bring things in from the outside. But I think you have to balance it and, and augment it with people that understand the realities and the day in and day out realities of what this league is. And maybe most importantly, I guess, what this league isn't. And I think to your point, a lot of teams think they're going to go their own way and they're going to ignore any type of influence or experience or history or case studies or best practices because they got it and they're going to do something different and they're going to, you know, <laughs> re- recreate the wheel or make a better wheel or whatever it is, wherever it is. And it, it doesn't necessarily work that way for the most part, not, not always. So we'll see, you know, we said, okay, they went South American with Tata and went big, right? And it worked out great guns. Then they went completely the opposite direction with DeBoer. And then I thought that there was, you know, this kind of return uh, especially with the recruiting process and the messaging with, uh, with Heinsohn. Now, where do they go? I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen down there, but I'm here for it. And all of the angst and the controversy and the drama that this creates, once again, in a strange way, it just shows how big and powerful Atlanta has become that, that so many people care. Because I'll be honest, there's a lot of teams, if this were to happen, it wouldn't even be on the radar. People wouldn't care. But because it's Atlanta and because of how big they have gotten in their initial set, uh, success, it does, it does matter. All right, a bunch of other stuff here, uh, M- MLS-wise. Uh, Mukhtar over there uh, for Nashville, fastest MLS hat trick in history. And this is good why. Well, uh, one, a home team wins in front of the crowd. But this is also a Nashville team that, you know, has not been known for a high-scoring uh, and exciting and entertaining brand of soccer. So this was uh, this was wonderful to see there. Minnesota, by the way, congratulations to the Loons. They did something that what uh, so many others couldn't do, which was break the uh, Sounders record streak of um, uh, of being undefeated in Major League Soccer. And with the with the parody and the manufactured parody that exists in Major League Soccer being undefeated for any length of time is, is a feat in, in uh, of itself. And that the Sounders did it for so long, congratulations to them, and then congratulations to Minnesota for finding a way to beat what is the best team in Major League Soccer. Uh, anything on those before we move on, Masi? Well, no, I mean, we were recently talking about Bob Bradley being in some trouble with LAFC, but they're playing better. They beat RSL Carlos Vela with a great winner. And so they've shot up to fifth. They're only three points behind the Galaxy in the standings. So LAFC finally getting going this season, huh? Well, I mean, so in essence, you're giving him and that team credit for actually living up to who they are, right? I mean, because it was it was never a question of all oh, they just they're just bad because they don't have good players it was a question of these good players are just not playing well and so and once again this this is not this is not me saying that they shouldn't be looked at and they shouldn't be um that we shouldn't celebrate something like this but this is for a lot of people one of the elite teams in the league and so when they actually start playing like one of the elite teams in the league should we be that surprised i guess we should given what they have done this year but um, well done. I guess they get a pat, they get a pat on the back. And once again, like Atlanta, this is, this is good for the league. LAFC being good is good for here in the, in, in the city that we live with Los Angeles, both Los Angeles, uh, the galaxy and LAFC being good. That's a good thing for the league. And that's a good thing, uh, for our city. Uh, what else? 
Uh, and then uh, I feel like we buried the lead here. Brenner with two goals for Cincinnati in a oh, wild 5-4 loss to Montreal. Disappointed they didn't get the result, but nevertheless, their, their record signing. Uh, he had scored from the penalty spot, so these are his first two from the run of play. So uh, I was happy and relieved to see that. <laughs> if, you had to, if you had to predict right now where Brenner is in two years, where would you say? Back in Brazil. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, look, I mean, it, it's hard, Masi, because you're judged oftentimes by your surroundings and the circumstances and, and being able to separate out a player, especially in a league like MLS that we just talked about with the, with the parody. It's, it's difficult. So, I mean, but look, he was hired to score goals, right? So that's, that's what he did. And so congratulations to him. So we'll see if this, if this changes the perception either, from an MLS perspective, uh, or uh, or from potential suitors out there going forward. Um, let's see what else. Portland. That was a fun scene up there with uh, the first time, obviously in a long time, where the stadium was able to be packed. So the folks up there in Portland got to scream and yell, and uh, get a win up there against FC Dallas, which struggles on the road. Ibobasi with a late goal in that one. That was a nice goal. Yeah, and nope. the place went crazy and. You could feel a kind of release for, I mean, everywhere that we're seeing crowds, you, you, you feel that, uh, and it's wonderful to see. And I'm still jealous sitting on the other side and watching it through a screen, whether it's watching what's going on up in the Portland game, for example, or what was happening in Dallas with Mexico and, uh, and El Salvador, or the game before that with Panama, uh, before that night with Panama and Honduras. I mean, some of these scenes we've missed them obviously and we haven't had them in so long that when you see them you are immediately reminded of how awesome it is and we're going to talk a little bit more about uh crowds and crowd noises later <laughs> on in the in the show what else mossy uh, you know bill parcells has a famous saying you are what your record is uh but nycfc are testing that this season because they might be a team that's uh, much better than their record. Uh, they lose 2-1 to Columbus, a game in which they had over 60% possession, outshot Columbus 21-6. to And I feel like they've had a zillion of those games this season in which they, they've clearly been the better team and yet have found a way to lose. I know Ian Joy is very frustrated by that. Um, so they're languishing down in seventh in the East, but they've actually played some of the best football I've seen in MLS this season. So hopefully those breaks start going their way and they start winning some of these games. But you know that this is, you know, this is Major League Soccer, right? And so you can get hot and squeak into the playoffs. And so this would be your typical team where you're sleeping on them because of their record during the regular season and they are sneaky good. I don't, I don't think that they're, I don't think people are sleeping on them. I think to your point, I think a lot of people are looking at them and saying, why isn't this translating into more results? And sometimes it's nothing that you're doing other than fate, kismet, destiny, uh, soccer gods, whatever you want to. Uh, call I, I think I think a lot of if you if you polled all of the coaches in Major League Soccer about what NYCFC is I think you'd have a lot of people being very very positive about what this team is and worried about facing them given what their record says and what the reality is when you actually are, are playing this team so I wouldn't be I wouldn't be too worried about it we know MLS for better or worse it's a very forgiving regular season as long as you get into the playoffs and if you're a good team that reboot that you get when you get into the playoffs sometimes can wash away what happened during the year. All right. Anything else MLS wise, Mossy? That's it. All right. We're going to take a real quick break. And when we come back, uh, we'll be talking about, oh yeah. I mean, what else? Messy. Don't go anywhere. All right. Welcome back. Oh yeah. Messy. I mean, the gift that just keeps on giving in terms of content, right? Uh, Messi, or, or Messi, Mossy, did you see that uh, Messi also broke a record? while well, he's having this summer when it comes to Instagram. So for those that don't know, I think, I think there was a Kardashian uh, Instagram that is the all time most liked on Instagram. Right. But when it comes to a sports situation, person, whatever, Messi evidently broke the record for the most like picture of all time on 
Instagram. It, no, by the way, it was Kardashian. And then somebody put up a picture of an egg, evidently. And people were just so angry that the Kardashian one was the highest ever that just out of spite, they, they made the egg one the most uh, viewed ever. But when it comes to sports, Messi has yet another record uh, breaking Ronaldo's record, which I'm sure makes him feel great. And if you've seen this picture, it's him sitting in front or standing, you know, squatting, kneeling in front of uh, the Copa America finally winning his Copa America. It's a pretty, you know, okay picture. It's not anything great, but what we attach to it is where the greatness and where I think all of the clicks come. And so congratulations, Messi, from a social media perspective of making history and breaking the, uh, the rec, not the record, just not only breaking the record, like we said, breaking Ronaldo's record, which while Messi is very private and doesn't boast uh, much, I'm sure deep down this makes him feel uh, pretty good. More messy, though, uh, and much more important stuff, let's be honest. Uh, it's done, right? He's signed. Yes? No? I mean, is, is this done? Well, uh, he's decided he wants to re-sign with Barcelona. They want him back. Uh, they've agreed on a five-year contract. So you think, okay, that's it, right? Well, it's not that simple. Uh, Barcelona have massive financial issues right now. And Spain has some very strict financial fair play rules. And Barcelona right now are not in compliance of that. And the La Liga president, Javier Tebas, said he is not going to bend the rules at all uh, to accommodate this messy contract. So they have to figure out a way to get this deal done in such a way where they're in compliance with those financial fair play rules. It's very difficult. And mind you, it would have been easier if this was a situation where they were uh, – re-signing or signing a contract extension but instead because they allowed the previous contract to run out and for him to become a free agent now this is like signing a new player and the rules are even more strict when it comes to that so Barcelona as of now they've agreed all these deals with with Aguero with Memphis Depay with Eric Garcia and 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 Messi and they they actually haven't been able to register any of these players and so they're scrambling to figure out a way to get some of these salaries off the books but for some of the lesser players they're just looking to rescind their contracts like Pjanic and Umtiti uh for others like Coutinho and Griezmann, they're actually trying to figure out a deal to unload them. There's been some talk about Griezmann going back to Atletico Madrid. Um, and by the way, Serginho Dest has even got caught up in this the last couple of days because Bayern Munich are sniffing around. They sense that Bayern, Barcelona might be so desperate to unload uh, some contracts that they might have to sell Serginho Dest. Remember, Bayern wanted to sign Serginho Dest last year and lost out on him to Barcelona. So now they're, they're seeing if perhaps they can end up with him. So uh, so it's, it's a crazy situation. I know we've all been programmed as fans when we hear the word financial fair play to kind of roll our eyes and think, OK, mm -hmm. if push comes to shove. That's not really going to come to anything. But with each passing day here, you start to wonder if this is a real issue, if they can even figure out a way to fit this messy contract, which by the way, he's already agreed to take uh, a big discount from his previous deal. So he's doing all he can to accommodate the situation, but it's still not enough. I mean, there's a simple solution to this Mossy. Okay. You get David Beckham and the ownership over there at inter Miami to figure this out. Okay. Uh, with their incredible knowledge and wisdom when it comes to how to do something like this. Um, Okay, so if, if, if it ends up being five years, that puts him at 39 going on 40. And so immediately folks that have, you know, harbored hopes and dreams of seeing him one day play here in the United States um, for an MLS club uh, say, eh, that might be a little much. Who knows? You never know. And who knows if it ends up playing, uh, playing out. I think what this ultimately says or confirms, because it's nothing new, this notion, is that this is a player who has grown up in the cocoon, in the incubator, in the warmth, in the protection of one club. And it is where he feels more, most comfortable. And I think that going anyplace else, I shouldn't say scares him, but I just don't think that it holds any real interest. I think this is what he has wanted to do all along. And I think that deep down, he recognizes that this environment, at times dysfunctional, admittedly, but this environment still is the best place for him and his family, let's be honest. And I think that this is a reflection of that, whether it's the, the pay cut or the, um, the length of time that this contract is going to be. This is going to be a player that will forever be associated with Barcelona. 
and that's a that's a wonderful thing. That's a wonderful thing for him, and a wonderful thing wonderful thing for for Barcelona. Um, but I will say, and I know I was joking around about Inter. There are ways that Messi is going to be made whole, shall we say? There are ways going forward, especially in the long term, when he when he stops kicking the ball, that Messi is going to be able to make up whatever he is. Uh, forgiving or giving back when it comes to uh, a deal right now. And he is and will continue to be uh, an icon for for this club and, and, and for the sport. And I'm actually I'm happy while while I do it, I, I do fantasize about what it would look like to see him put on another jersey in this day and age where we know it's so rare. It is kind of cool. And there is a there is a romantic part to what he evidently is going to do once again it's not a, a done deal but it looks like it's going to be if they figure out how to work this but what is going to be ultimately around him when he gets on the field and and does he care because at, at his at his core he is a competitor and he has been incredibly successful and if in order to accommodate him you're completely decimating the team that's around him by the way a team that i think he also feels javi is going to be a part of in the, in the very near future. So I, I think he's also thinking about these next couple of years very much so. And it, it's interesting you say that all the guys I mentioned they're trying to unload are guys they kind of sort of want to get rid of anyway. It will be interesting if this messy situation rises to the level where they have to start getting rid of guys that are important players moving forward, like Ter Stegen or Frankie de Jong, or God forbid, a Pedro and Ansu Fati. That's when it becomes a real problem. They'll do it because ultimately they want to keep Messi at, at, at any cost, but they would love to do it without having to get rid of anybody that's a core guy moving forward. And, and it is the one thing they have in their favor is that uh, Dembele, Coutinho, and Griezmann were all bought by the previous president, Bartomeu. And so as long as he was in charge, there was some sentiment to either try to make it work with those players, or if they were going to get rid of him, try to get a decent amount back because that president didn't want the embarrassment of people being able to say, boy, you paid this much for this guy and sold him for that much. Now there's a new president in Laporta. And so he doesn't care as much about that because they weren't his signings. So he's, he's willing to unload those guys for less just to get their contracts off the books. And if, if anybody wants to hit him over the head over, but you paid this much, he can say, well, it wasn't me. I wouldn't have signed those guys. I certainly wouldn't have given him that much money. Um, and so he can plausibly say that. And so they might be able to make something work with, with, with Coutinho and Griezmann. Dembele, this injury he picked up at, at the Euros is problematic. He's going to be out several months. And there were teams like Manchester United that were interested, but now everybody's going to wait and see how, how he looks. So they're probably going to have to have Dembele on the team for another season. But I suspect before this summer's out that Coutinho and Griezmann will be on other teams. Griezmann, there's been this talk about a swap deal with Atletico for Saul. And Coutinho, it looks like, I think will end up back in the Premier League with somebody that somebody will be willing to pay somewhere in the neighborhood of 20, 25 million euros. And I think at this point, Barcelona would just take that and cut their losses with him all right well speaking of of transfers i know there's still a lot of stuff that's going on and that is going to happen as we get through uh through this summer i know you wanted to hit on uh, some at least at least the really really um high profile and, and interesting ones well psg has been the most active team uh this summer they've made a lot of moves uh they picked up Jorginho when all them actually stole him from barcelona who thought they had to deal with him uh, they, they signed Georgina Wijnaldum on a free. They signed Sergio Ramos on a free. Uh, they signed Donnarum on a free. And by the way, I keep saying free. They gave these guys pretty big contracts. So a free transfer <laughs> isn't exactly free. The one guy they paid a big transfer free for was Ashraf Hakimi, who they signed from Inter. Uh, all good moves really improved that team. They're looking like a real force for the Champions League this season. This might be the year finally. However, this is all occurring against the backdrop of the Mbappe situation. He has told them he is not going to sign an extension. He has one more year left. Uh, and yet uh, it doesn't sound like they're going to adopt a philosophy of, oh, we might as well get something for him this summer. They're going to hold on to him and exhaust every effort to change his mind to convince him to resign, which might not mean losing him for free next summer. I suppose the one club that could withstand that is PSG. <laughs> um, so it's going to be fascinating to see how that plays out. I think he does have his heart set on going to uh, Real Madrid, although I wouldn't completely rule out Liverpool, but Real Madrid, certainly the favorites there to eventually end up with Mbappe. Um, so, but, uh, I mean, what, what, what are your thoughts on Sergio Ramos going to PSG? Might that be the kind of player that can finally instill that sort of DNA that's been lacking in that team and maybe get him over the hump in the champions league? Yeah. I mean, I still think that Sergio Ramos has plenty of fuel left in the tank. And I think, yeah, I mean, I think, I think he remains motivated to do something. And look, when, when he tells you to do something, you do it. And that type of leadership, and that type of intensity 
And I know at times he's on the edge. At times he, 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 he's had to learn to control it. But I, I feel like it's just what the doctor ordered. I like it. And on the Donnarumma situation, look, it's, it's yet again very harsh on Kaylor Navas. But I will say uh, <laughs> what PSG are doing here feels less egregious than what Real Madrid did a couple of years ago. First off, while Kaylor Navas has been very good with PSG, he hasn't won three Champions League titles. He doesn't have the currency of PSG that he had at Real Madrid. And also, uh, Real Madrid bought... Uh, a, a, a goalkeeper at a more advanced age and Thibaut Courtois, they paid a big transfer fee for him. So it's a little bit different than what's happened here. PSG, this is just an incredible market opportunity that arose to get a kid who's 22 years old, who's going to be the best goalkeeper in the world for the next decade on a free transfer while Navas is 34. So it's a little bit awkward. It's a bit harsh, on, but it's not completely ridiculous. You can kind of see why PSG are making this move. Yeah, I mean, you know, the framing of Navas as this Rodney Dangerfield type of, <laughs> type of character. I mean, don't cry for, for Mr. Navas. He's going to be just fine. Don't you worry. I think he would probably tell us the same thing. Uh, and then, you know, there's been this little center back uh, merry-go-round uh, because, you know, I, I just mentioned, uh, so it began with Upa Meccano going from Leipzig to Bayern Munich. So Jesse Marsh will have to do without him uh, this upcoming season. And David Alaba went from Bayern to Real Madrid. And Real Madrid, it looks like, are going to lose. Obviously, they've lost Sergio Ramos and Rafael Varane, who it looks like is going to go to Manchester United. So that's been kind of an interesting little center back merry-go-round. And Manchester United, let's go there next. It looks like they're going to complete deals here in the next few days for Jaden Sancho and Rafael Varane. So they're, they're looking to make a real move here. Uh, we'll see what City and Chelsea do the rest of the summer. The City have been linked with Harry Kane and, and Grealish and, and Chelsea are trying to get a center forward. First it was Holland and now I've even been hearing Lewandowski. So we'll have to wait and see what those two teams do because they came out of last season looking like the class of, of, of English football. But Manchester United at least trying to make a move there to get up in, into that upper tier. Huh? So wait, these are these uh, the horrible American owners? <laughs> uh, that are getting Varan and uh, Sancho. I just want to make sure these are the same team and, and same ownership that we're talking about, right? That yep, are going to spend yep. all of this money and uh, and go and get these two wonderful players to improve their product. And then another American-owned team, Liverpool, they signed Konate, the other center back uh, from Leipzig. So Jesse Marsh is going to have to rebuild that back line next season. Uh, so yeah, it's been, you know, because of these international tournaments, players kind of wanted to focus on that. So it hasn't been a crazy amount of activity yet, but it's, but there's been some interesting stuff that's happened. And I think the next few weeks will be, will be very crazy. As well, well, let me, let me finish it up here. Cause it, you know, for that, the Jaden Sancho thing is fascinating to me. Um, you know, the pathway that he took and how this, how his stardom has been, um, built because it is the road less traveled, uh, for an English player. So now he's returning. He's not necessarily returning a conquering hero, but he's certainly returning with a, um, with a popularity completely different than when he left. How do you see it going? Because, you know, sometimes that returning doesn't always go the way that you plan. And maybe, you know, you don't, the grass is not always greener is what I'm saying. I am an unabashed uh, Jaden Sancho fan. I, I understand your concerns, but I think he's going to do great. I think this okay. is a phenomenal move, and and I'm salivating over the prospect of Sancho and Rashford and Greenwood. So, um, okay. yeah, I think I think it's a, it's a great signing for Manchester. I, you know, I, he, he came I up want with it to the, happen. He I came up with the happen. city youth system, became disenchanted there, left to go to Germany. So it's even more fascinating that he's now chosen to go back, same city but other club, Manchester United. So he's going to have a point to prove, and for any of those Manchester derbies. A part of me also wants it to, to show that there are different pathways um, and that, you know, if you are a young English player, you don't have to be myopic. You don't have to, you know, just simply be focusing on, and I know it's, you know, the most popular league in the world and, you know, some would argue the greatest league in the world, but there's, there are other options. And, and I think from an English perspective, you want as many different potential options out there as possible for your developing talent. And if you just ignore or don't pay any attention to something like the Bundesliga, I, I don't think you're necessarily doing yourself or your, your development, any type of, of favor. So I'll be excited too, to see what that happens. Anything else? Moss? And then last, last one, and then we'll move on. Okay. Uh, Atletico Madrid signed Rodrigo de Paul from Udinese, which is a phenomenal move. We just watched him have 
uh, a man of the match performance in the Copa America final for Argentina against Brazil, including the uh, contentious assist to Di Maria, which you and Ali Wagner are still <laughs> arguing about. Uh, but perfect Simeone player, great move for them. And we'll see if they end up getting Antoine Griezmann back. They had the Paul. If Griezmann, you know, we know he struggled to adapt to Barcelona, but putting him back at Atletico, if he becomes a player he was with them, boy, Atletico all of a sudden making some some really nice moves here. So uh, well, that'll we'll be fun. That. That'll be fun to see them. All right, uh, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, oh, yeah, time for Ask Alexi. Don't go anywhere. All right, we're back, and it's time for Ask Alexi. Uh, keep in mind, we do have our hotline now up and working and people leaving messages. Actually, we got three of them this week. Uh, we got more than that, but we got, we're going to use three this week. 657-549-2297. That's 657-549-2297. Um, Mossy, uh, who should we listen to first? Uh, we going in order here. Is it uh, Charles? Charles, I think. And I think he's from Mass, uh, Massachusetts, that is. So let's see what Charles has to say. Hi, Alexi and Mossy. This is Charles in Massachusetts. And uh, my question today actually comes with a bit of a backstory. Uh, as we all saw in the Euro final, uh, Raheem Sterling is taken down in the box for a penalty. Whether or not that was a penalty is a different question. But for the sake of this one, uh, Harry Kane steps up and Casper Schmeichel does great to uh, make a, a save and obviously the ball rebounds back to Harry Kane and he has a very easy tap in for the goal. And so my question is, what are your thoughts um, on changing the rule so that the penalty taker can never score from their own rebound? Because it seems slightly unfair that you know, as hard as it already is to save the penalty, it, it makes it even more hard if it just rebounds back to the taker and they have an easier tap in you know, on an even more open goal. Um, just love to hear your thoughts. Uh, appreciate all that you guys do for soccer in the United States and uh, love listening to the show. Thanks. Okay, Charles. Interesting. Uh, yeah, I mean, this summer we've seen our, sh- our, our fair share of, of penalties, both in, both kicks from the spot after the, you know, in, uh, you know, with a shootout, but we've also seen them in the course of the game. So I, I guess, what he's saying is he doesn't like the fact that the, the shooter gets to potentially put in his or her rebound. I, I have no problem with it because, you know, by the way, when that happens, just from a, uh, a scoring perspective, it's not, it, it's not counted as a penalty um, goal. It's counted as in the run of play because the moment that uh, the, uh, the goalkeeper hits it um, or somebody else hits it, it is in the run of play. I, I don't think that you should change that. As a matter of fact, I think that if you were to change something, I would have no problem saying that if it hit the post and or cross uh, and or crossbar and came back and somebody put it in, that I'd have no problem saying that that's a, a, a goal too. I don't know. So I'm going to the opposite way. No, I, I thought about this uh, this morning. I kind of agree with this guy. It is a little lame to me when a guy takes a penalty, the goalkeeper saves it, but it comes right back to him and he puts it in. Uh, I, I think that what, what he proposes is actually something to think about, that the guy who took the penalty can't be the first person to touch it uh, on a rebound. But he's not being the first person to touch it. He's being <laughs> the second person to touch it. I mean, so, so, so two people have to touch it now before he can touch it? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Oh, my goodness. I mean, I, I think we're in the weeds here when it comes to uh, <laughs> rule changes. Although, did you? Did, I don't know if you read the story. I, I, I don't have it in front of me, but there are some things going on with regards to rule changes in terms of lengths of half that are just being tested out there. And, and um, like I said, nothing's going to nothing's imminent. Nothing's going to happen. But there are some th- interesting things going on. Length of half um, kick ins, you know, different stuff that's uh, that's going on. Our 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 sport, I mean, we've seen our sport change just within our lifetime, but, you know, who knows what the sport looks like 50 years from now uh, in terms of the laws of the game or the way that it, that it is played. So who knows, Charles from Massachusetts, you might get your way or I might get my way in that if somebody is able to bank it off the crossbar and get it back and then put it in, that would count. All right, uh, let's go to uh, who's next. Uh, it is Ryan. Um, Ryan. Okay, let's hear what Ryan has to say on our uh, State of the Union hotline. Hey, Alexi and David. My name's Ryan Yao, and I have a question for the show. So, we're seeing more and more soccer players pursue other ventures outside of soccer, including furthering their education and investing in areas that will future-proof their careers more than just being a professional athlete will for 15 or so plus years. I was wondering what the athlete mindset 
from your point of view as a former professional, Alexi, brings to corporations and other fields outside of the game? What say would a benefit be of hiring a former midfielder as a company CFO instead of a person who is strictly academic their whole life? Thanks for featuring my question and love the show. Okay, Ryan. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, asking about the the athlete's mindset and how that may or may not translate into the corporate world. Okay, so oftentimes you will hear people say that athletes or participation in sports arms you with uh, many of the skills and tools that are transferable to the the business world or the corporate world. I, I, I can see that and I can certainly make a case in certain instances where that, where, where things do apply. I don't think that it applies as much as people like to believe. And you know, you'll talk about leadership and cooperation and communication and all and human dynamics and personalities and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, I think that applies to anything. I don't think it's specific that you learn about it necessarily in sports. There are things and lessons absolutely that you learn in sports that can help you later on in life. But I'm telling you right now, if athletes were to act in the same way and make the same choices that they made as athletes in a locker room or in an athletic environment, in a boardroom uh, or in a front office or in any type of business environment, it would not go well. In a lot of cases, it would not go well. As a matter of fact, you probably get fired and or and in some cases, maybe even arrested. Who knows? So I, I, I do think that there is a, a value. I think oftentimes both the athletes and the people that are potentially hiring those athletes or that do hire uh, those athletes, they give much too much value and credence to those lessons, that they are able to translate those lessons into, I guess, the real world is what we'll call it here. Uh, and I'm not saying that, that you don't learn. And I've seen, you know, I, I went through it myself. And what I found is that there are, there are certain universals when it comes to how you behave with human beings. But there are also some things that, that you leave in the past when it comes to the sport that you're involved in, especially when it's a professional environment, that just they don't always translate, even in, in the way that you inter the way that you interact. I grew more in the years and during the decade in which I was working in the front office as a human being because of this new environment, and to a certain extent, a very unique and strange environment than I did when I was playing in, in my career, because it was so different. And once again, yes, there were tools and different things that I could call upon. But for the most part, um, and I'm not talking about, you know, giving a hype speech or a TED talk or corporate uh, when you come into a corporation and, and you, you talk about your life and you talk about motivation and all that kind of stuff, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about day in and day out working within that type of environment. Um, but, you know, there also are things like practice, like motivation of yourself and motivation of others. I talked about communication, uh, cooperation. And, you know, when to pat someone on the back, when to kick them in the ass, all that, all that kind of stuff that, yeah, I think they're, that, that they, that you can take with you, but I think, I think we give it too much, uh, too much value. I would be much more hesitant to put my entity, my business, or a part of my business in the hands and in charge of someone simply because they were an athlete or professional or whatever level. Um, I would, I would think twice about that. Okay. Um, what's next, Moss? Last one is Tim. Tim, I think, and I think he's from Indiana. Let's find out. Tim, what do you have to say? Hey, Alexi and Mossy. This is uh, Tim from Clarksville, Indiana. Um, I enjoy your all's podcast. Listen to it every week. Um, I'm watching the Gold Cup on Fox uh, right now between Qatar and Panama. And the game is being played in Houston. There are fans present, but I noticed that 
you're pumping in fake crowd noise or using fake crowd noise on your telecast. And I thought that was rather strange considering that there are fans present. Um, and it just honestly, from a presentation standpoint, it makes a game like awkward because you'll see a goal and then you'll hear the fake crowd react like five seconds afterwards. And I thought that was strange. And I actually, it jumped out at me because it actually skips on the TV. If you listen, you can hear the crowd noise stop while John Strong is still commentating. Oh, okay. Interesting, Tim from Indiana. Uh, now, I I did not realize that this was a possibility in that I assumed that with the return of fans in this tournament, as opposed to Copa America, in this tournament, that's the Gold Cup, where we do have fans in attendance and some very, very big crowds, that the enhanced audio that we have used, not just for Copa America, but over the last year and a half for the soccer that we do at Fox and for other sports that we do, uh, would have gone away. So um, I did some digging. And I found that it has gone away. So I don't know what you are listening to or what you heard on your broadcast, but I can assure you that whatever it was, it was not augmented um, or enhanced audio from our part that we have used in the past. So we are taking the natural sounds that are part of, uh, of the game. And I think that that's, that's fair. Now, keep in mind that in doing so, because they're not always big crowds. And as we have gotten back to crowds, oftentimes it's been this percentage and then this percentage and this percentage. It's not necessarily a big crowd. So it can still feel very empty and very stark, but even a small crowd we've found is better than the, not always better than the enhanced audio, but especially since we've missed it for so long is what we are, what we are giving you. And thankfully we're getting huge crowds. I mean, the noise when it comes to, like I said, the game, the Mexico El Salvador game or the, um, the U S game in, uh, in Kansas city was just, I've missed that. I've missed that sweet, that sweet sound. Cause it's, it's hard to replicate these guys, you know, that we've worked with did an incredible job. I, I will use this, this question from Tim to, to tell you guys something that, you know, every broadcast does things differently. We at Fox do differently than ESPN, than NBC, than CBS, than, and on and on and on. Everybody produces the game to a certain extent differently, different editorial choices, and just practically the way that we are choosing to watch it or to broadcast it and audio. We at Fox, and one thing that you will find is that we have the Nats, the, uh, the natural sound at a much higher level. We feel that that is the best experience for our viewers. So much so that at times it is even rival, rivaling the audio of the broadcasters. So if you're listening to John, uh, John Strong and Stu Holden calling a game, oftentimes the audio that we use is pushed up to equal at times what the uh, voices are. And I've had people tell me at times, I can't hear everything that uh, our broadcasters are saying. I'm telling you right now that that, that is by design. Not that you, we don't want you to hear what they are saying, but we feel that that is a better experience. And others don't necessarily feel that. And you can listen to other and, and watch others that have that balance at a little different level. But the balance that we have is what we do at Fox, not just for soccer, but for, for sports in general, because we feel that that gives the best uh, experience to, to the viewer. Even at times, if it may be overriding something that you hear and you may miss a word here or there, we just feel that having the voices of the people that are calling the game be so separated and apart and on top of what is happening isn't always conducive to the best, uh, the best broadcast. But once again, that's a, a choice that we make as a company and other companies do it differently. But Tim, I can assure you that uh, for games that have fans, we are using the audio from the natural environment that is occurring there. We are not adding anything uh, going forward. So I don't know, maybe it's your TV or maybe there was a glitch or something that you heard. But regardless, thank you for listening to the pod. And thank you to uh, Charles, Ryan, and Tim, not just for listening to the pod, but also for using our hotline. Once again, 
The Ask Alexi hotline is 657-549-2297. That's 657-549-2297. We've been getting a bunch of calls, uh, some really, really good calls. And uh, thank you for using this, uh, you know, this vehicle to get us those, uh, those questions. Mossy, anything uh, from Ask Alexi? That's it. All right, we're going to take another quick break. And when we come back, we're going to wrap it up here on the State of the Union. And as we always do, I'll have my one for the road. All right, we're back. And we've come to the end of yet another show. And at the end of each and every show, as you know, I give you my one for the road. Uh, Mossy, I don't know if you saw this, but the valuations for Major League Soccer teams came out last week. Now, this is not an exact science, but if you go to... um, uh, what is it? Sportico, I think. Uh, they have ranked, if you will, all of the teams in Major League Soccer and attributed a valuation to that team. But as I said, it's not exact, but they're using all of the data available to give you a ballpark estimation of what the value of that team is. So, for example, uh, at the top is LAFC. And they're in the eight and a half hundred million dollar range. Okay. Uh, then you have Atlanta United, which is also in the eights, LA Galaxy. Uh, those types of teams are at the, at the top. Seattle Sounders. Top five is LA, uh, Atlanta, LA, uh, LA Galaxy, Seattle, and New York City FC. All right. Not necessarily a surprise when, when it comes to these, uh, these teams. We've talked already about the relevance of some of these teams, including Atlanta. Bottom teams. Um, Bottom five are Dallas, Orlando, Vancouver, Montreal, and then last place is the Colorado Rapids. Not necessarily a surprise to anyone, but keep in mind that Colorado Rapids right now, valuation of, oh, it's like mid mid 300s um, to high 300s when it comes to what they are. So your valuation goes from uh, $850 million at the top when it comes to LAFC to the bottom where it's Colorado Rapids at, let's say, $370 million. Why, why is this interesting? Is it important? I don't know. But I, I love it. I think it's really, really interesting because we talk often about, you know, there was a time not too long ago in the, in the early aughts when you could have bought an MLS team for $10 million. Now they're selling in the 300s. And that's just for the sale of the expansion team. That doesn't include the stadium, which is another couple hundred million dollars. If you're doing training centers, uh, whatever, you know, and then the actual money that you are spending on running your team and staff and, and designated players and that kind of stuff. So it is very, very quickly ticked up in terms of the amount you need just to get in to this club. And I know it's a closed club that is Major League Soccer. But also, this is, for many of these owners, an investment, an investment that they feel is going to appreciate. And certainly, if you look at what has happened over the last 20 years, the dramatic increase in value of these teams is something to behold. And I think a feather in the cap for Major League Soccer. Now, we all know that when it comes to valuing things in life, it's what somebody will pay, okay? And we can sit from the outside and say, that's ridiculous. I can't believe that this costs this or this costs this or why would anybody pay for it? Well, if somebody's willing to pay for it, that's what the value is. So just because it is eight, eight, $870 million doesn't necessarily mean that there is somebody that is going to pay for that. But, you know, given what's happened in this history, um, you know, there's, there's a good chance that at some point it's going to be worth, uh, worth even more. Now, why, why am I bringing this up? My good friend Grant Wall uh, tweeted when this came out, as a lot of people did, because this is, this is like catnip to us soccer folks, right? Um, and it, uh, it either it confirms or dispels notions that you have about Major League Soccer and what it is as a business and what it isn't as a business and all that. But anyway, my friend Grant Wall tweeted, uh, when MLS teams are worth more than all but a tiny few soccer clubs in Europe due mostly to no promotion and relegation, it's worth saying maybe there should be promotion and relegation. Grant is hoping for incentives to adopt it coming from future TV rights holders. And I wrote back to Grant, and look, Grant's a friend of mine, and I have incredible respect for uh, who he is as a person and uh, for his takes, whether I agree with them or not. In this case, it was a little confusing. And so I said, do you want MLS teams to be worth less? And maybe I was being a little simplistic and and flip a little bit, but you know, it's Twitter, that's what we we do. Um, The fact that Major League Soccer teams have these high valuations, okay, for a league that is 
25 years old. That is a good thing, okay? Of course, it's good for the owners. So you as a person, me as a person, it doesn't help us in that we don't own any of this asset, right? But the fact that there is ownership that sees these as valuable, the fact that the valuation continues to increase, all right, that is important because if that is not the case, then there is less investment, there are less invest investors, and there is less interest in this as a business. And ultimately, when it comes down to it, yes, it's a sport that we love and we have incredible passion and emotion for it, but this is a business. And without the functioning business and without the robust and successful business going on, we have less of a business, we have less of a sport, and in many cases, and you certainly can look back and you can see, we have no leagues, with the folding of teams with the folding of leagues. So this is a good thing. I don't want these teams to be worth less. Do I want the league to be more popular? Yeah, that's a conversation that we can certainly have. Are there things that these ownership groups, either collectively or individually, can do to make it more popular and drive value in terms of their valuations? Yeah, absolutely. But if 25 years in Major League Soccer, and you are, you are looking at this right now and looking at this list, uh, that, I said, is a good thing. That is a good thing for the sport. That is a good thing for, uh, for the league going forward, that people recognize it as this asset that is appreciating. And you know, whether it's Grant or anybody else, uh, I don't want it to go the other way. And you wouldn't say that about you know, another asset that you, that you acquired. If you acquire it, you want it to not just retain value, but you want to appreciate and increase in value going forward. And how, it, how, it, how that happens is partly the strategy that you employ. It's partly time. Uh, it's partly you know, the, the whims of, of the world out there. But you know, if this was an apartment or if this was a piece of art or if this was something else, you can scratch your head or be angry at the fact that there are people out there that could possibly pay this much or even possibly put a price tag on it in, 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 uh, in this value. But I think it's a good thing. And I think it's a good thing uh, for soccer. And look, uh, I, I know what, what Grant, to a certain extent, was trying to say. And I think he was having a couple of different conversations uh, come together. And the valuations relative to teams over in Europe are very, very different. And while a team and or a league and or a soccer culture may be more quote unquote popular, their teams and their team values may be much, may be much less. I think it shows the bullish nature of, um, of investors when it comes to soccer and the future of soccer and how they want to get in on it for a number of different reasons. Some are very admirable, some maybe not so admirable, but ultimately uh, you need the business to be successful and you need the business to be seen as continuing to grow and be of value. And so, you know, ultimately I think that this is, uh, this is a good thing, but I wanted to you know, address that and clarify it because I think it's a fascinating subject. And as I said, when anybody puts out a list out like this, everybody's gonna have an idea about what this means and what this means for the league and what this means for the sport and what this means for the team. So have at it and let us know uh, what you think. Mossy, anything before we go? Uh, one last thing, our producer, Jeff Hernandez, uh, pulled an absolute shocker this week. He forgot to include Olympic soccer in the rundown, but uh, that does fire up this week. Uh, so I just wanna get everybody ready for that. Um, remember, this is Japan, so, you might recall uh, from you know the World Cup, we had an Asia in 2002. There's some crazy <laughs> uh, uh, kickoff times for us here in the United States. So uh, the U.S. women, uh, uh, their first match is this Wednesday morning. It's 1.30 a.m. Pacific time. Oh, my. Uh, 4.30 a.m. Uh, Eastern time. So Luis Aguilar coming home from the club can turn on the TV Perfect. and watch Perfect. it. Uh, Brazil, uh, it's even earlier. Uh, the Brazil women, Pia Sunhagen, uh, 1 a.m. Wednesday morning, they play their first match against China, uh, but the U.S., the overwhelming favorites to win the gold medal. The men's tournament gets underway on Thursday, the following day. Mexico, who I think have a very good team, uh, 1 a.m. Thursday morning, they face France. Um, Brazil in action later on that day. Uh, they face Germany. 
uh, at the same stadium that was the site of the 2002 World Cup final between uh, Brazil and Germany when Brazil won 2 0, Ronaldo scored two goals. Uh, maybe the happiest day of my life. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, you know, uh, we have the summer of soccer rolls on. We have another tournament to look forward to but on the men's side, looking at all the squads, obviously there were a lot of issues with getting players released. I think Spain have the strongest team. So I would make them the favorites, but Brazil who are the defending champions, you might recall won the gold medal in 2016 in, in Rio, that final against Germany at the Maracanã, they won on penalties. Neymar converted the winning kick. I would say Brazil is up there as well. Uh, maybe, maybe second to Spain on the list of favorites, but uh, should be interesting. Looking forward to uh, watching some Olympic soccer. Well, look, uh, from an American perspective, obviously, we don't have a men's team in there. So it's all about the women. They're going to have the stage all to themselves when it comes to soccer. <clears throat> you should expect your, your women, as always, to win the gold. And anything less would be a failure. And they are going with all guns blazing. I think the real question when it comes to the U.S. women's national team is, who is going to be this 11? You got Carly Lloyd continuing on. You have Alex Morgan coming back. Uh, you have Morgan Press playing so well, but you have Tobin Heath and Julie Ertz who are coming back from injury. And if they're healthy, I mean, I think they're starters. And so then that takes players out. You got Megan Rapino who continues uh, continues on. You got that back four that's kind of been set and just played every single game. And then Alyssa Nair in goal. So a lot of the familiar faces, they should win gold. And this is a team that has built themselves on winning and living up to very, very high expectations and consistent expectations. So Best of luck to our uh, to our women as they head off to another uh, Olympic campaign and hopefully bring back the gold for us. As to all of the uh, the athletes out there, I hope everybody stays safe um, first and foremost and has a wonderful Olympics. I know it's going to be different without fans and everything, but regardless of uh, if you're uh, bringing home the gold for the U.S. Uh, or just participating, have a wonderful time. Congratulations, even before it starts to all of the Olympians out there, uh, Americans and uh, all the Olympians that are representing all the countries out there. I look forward to uh, watching that. We will be back again next week. Same time, same place here. Thank you so much for writing and uh, sending your questions, uh, reviewing and rating and subscribing and downloading and doing all the different things that you do. We really, really appreciate it. And uh, we certainly don't take it for granted. All right, we'll, uh, we'll talk again here uh, next week. And until then, and as always, size the day. You like that clip? Well, my State of the Union podcast drops every week. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.